11 of Thank you very much for joining. I'm Brigitte Toy Ludic, I'm Program Manager and Training Coordinator at ICANN, and I'm standing in for Anna Fondran, the Executive Manager of ICANN. Just before we start, um, I just left my um, video on so that you can see me, but I'm going to stop my video to preserve some bandwidth, and we're just going to, to um, discuss some house rules. All right, so um, all participants and panelists will keep off, um, will please keep themselves muted and the videos off to secure some bandwidth. And also because it's very disturbing um, if there are people that's not muted. If you have any questions, please post them in the questions and answer box at the bottom of your screen. We cannot attend to raise hands and questions will be answered after all speakers are done. You have to attend at least four out of the six webinars in a series and stay on for at least 60 minutes before you can get a certificate of attendance, which Suzanne from ACDC will send out. There will be simultaneous translations in Arabic and Portuguese. Please choose the language of choice at the language option um, icon at the bottom of the screen to access the correct translation. There will be a French session similar to the English session every Thursday and presentations will are all recording and, and all recordings will be available at the ICANN website um, on the ICAM website after the webinar series um, has been completed. So this week we are going to talk about the PPE dilemma and changes in future IPC practices. Um, we have two presenters for today. The one is Dr. Fami Ahmed from Ethiopia and then Dr. Uh, and then Professor Shade Ogonzula from Nigeria. In between the two speakers, we are going to take a short break just to give the presenters a moment to rest their voices. So I'm going to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Fami Ahmed, and he's going to talk about the use of PPE, compliance by staff and community, and the impact on their system. Dr. Ahmed is the IPC focal person at the WHO country office in Addis um, Ababa, and he is the vice chairman of the Ethiopian IPC Society. So without further ado, um, Dr. Ahmed, I am hand over to you. Thank you very much for being willing to do the presentation today. Thank you, Brady. You know, uh, I just present, uh, share the presentation. Can you see it? Not yet. I can't yet see your presentation. No? No, not yet. Not yet? No. Um, if you want, no, I want you to see it. If you want, I can also share it from my side. All right, we can see it now. Um, it's just not in presenter mode, but we can see your screen. Um, Dr. Ahmed, I think you are sharing the wrong screen because we can see your notes. So perhaps you just want to share your other screen.
Perfect. We can see it. Um, it's just not in presenter mode. It's it's still your your um, notes screen that that you are sharing. So we can also see your notes if that is okay with you. Is it okay if we share from this side? Yes, um, Dr. Ahmed, is it okay for you if we share it from our side? Suzanne, I think you can continue to share it from your side. Dr. Ahmed, you are still muted. Sorry, Suzanne, are you going to share the slides from your side? Yes, I can share from my side also. Yes, please. So share us from your side, I'm waiting. All right, perfect. And um, once it's shared, Dr. Ahmed, you can start. Thank you. No, no, this is not a presentation. This is a waste management. It's different. Maybe I... No, I'm presenting the PPE, not the waste management. Uh, I mean, not the waste okay. management, the PPE. That's perfect. You yes, don't know the will, PPE? Yes, I, I will share it. Um, I, I have, I have, sorry, one minute. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and okay. over to you, Dr. Ahmed. Next, please. Uh, the, so my topic is PPE during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the experience of Ethiopia. This is a presentation developed by WHO in collaboration with the uh, ministry EPHI uh, colleagues. Uh, so my presentation focused on the following, the overview of uh, COVID, introduction to PPE, the key achievements, performances. That is a major focus on my presentation, then the key challenges and the way forward. Next, please. So uh, the COVID overview, you know, uh, as everybody knows, the WHO declared outbreak of public health emergency as COVID uh, as international concern in the 13th of January, 2020, uh, which the pandemic was uh, really uh, established on 11th of March, 2020 by WHO. So then Ethiopia reported the first case on 13th of March, 2020. Next, please. Uh, and then uh, when we see the COVID, uh, the last uh, two years uh, situation, we have uh, four waves. Uh, the first wave of around August, 2020, uh, after you know the, the virus entered in March, we have the first wave, uh, which was really, the first wave was low uh, and the, uh, more flattened. And the second wave is you know upper than the second, but the third wave is again, you know, more flat, uh, but, with the fourth wave, it is quite different. It reached about to you know the peak was about five more than five thousand cases per day reported. So, but the, the fourth wave, the difference is it it just returned back very fast. You know, it returned back very fast. So maybe due to the virus characterization, what the different factors that really uh, showed different patterns of the, the waves. Next, please. So uh, the PP introduction, as uh, all we know, uh, PP provides physical barrier uh, or protection from pathogenic and microorganisms. Uh, so PP is effective when it is, uh, you know, used in combination with 
uh, other, you know, uh, preventive measures like hand hygiene, administrative, environmental injury control, IPC areas. Uh, and then uh, uh, we are advocating that, uh, you know, it's a benchmark uh, as a rule, PPE selection should be based on risk assessment that uh, we recommend as a technical person to be done every time a person is uh, providing service uh, for the health worker or exposing himself in different for different scenarios. So the risk assessment before putting any type of PPE, combination of PPEs is a very important uh, risk assessment of the situation, the type and the duration of exposure to body fluids. So the other critical issue is putting and uh, on and uh, removing PPE in uh, proper order in a manner is just as important as wearing the PPE. So this is a critical element of uh, putting PPE and removing PPE is the critical element of the, the process of using PPE and the proper, proper prevention of uh, the spread of the virus among the health workers, patient and the community. So if not, uh, this can lead to exposure to infectious agents uh, uh, very rampant, you know, in, 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 in high scale. Next, please. So the key achievement is uh, in uh, for the last uh, two years is, you know, WHO had, uh, we adopted WHO rational use of PPEs guideline, uh, which was issued in second version on July, 2020, then disseminated to all uh, the, the health facilities in the country uh, to follow that guidance. Uh, then the PPE is one of the critical topic included in the healthcare workers uh, wash uh, home-based, uh, you know, uh, uh, treatment guideline, uh, the training package, as well as home-based guidance, uh, home-based uh, uh, treatment and care guidance. So uh, uh, procurement and distribution of uh, different type of PPE, PPEs for healthcare workers, uh, as well as quarantine isolation centers uh, was conducted on several locations. Uh, WHO provided uh, PPEs and assisted the government to procure so based on need, uh, starting from the beginning, uh, every six months, uh, procurement was done and provided uh, accordingly. Uh, local production, the other thing as a strategy, local production of closed masks, uh, especially in 2020, uh, after WHO uh, put a guidance uh, in the cover on and the face shields also tried. Uh, some universities also have a lot of projects as a pilot uh, to try, especially as a beginning. Uh, finally, it happened that, you know, uh, some factories also engage on production of masks, uh, cover all and the face shields as well. Next, please. So uh, uh, promoted use of the recommended PPEs in COVID treatment centers. You know, these are the eye wears uh, regularly the face mask, gloves, and the long, long sleeve uh, gowns. Uh, not uh, basically the cover, the long sleeve gowns was more promoted than the cover all. The cover all, you know, it, it was, we have utilized the one we, we brought for the uh, Ebola situation that was uh, used, but finally the long sleeve gowns were more, you know, produced and also recommended to be used as per the WHO guideline. Uh, WHO distributed uh, the donning doffing posters uh, during the training and also all health facilities have been provided uh, as well as some videos for those people who are really uh, able to use the videos. Uh, we conducted trainings on site orientations as well for health professionals, uh, support staff like you know cleaners and others and also the general public on the use and the function of the PPEs, the, the, the utilization and also the importance of the PPEs. Uh, even at community level, basically it was uh, the face mask and also the, uh, the gloves. Uh, basically the public is promoted to use the face mask, but in some occasion like handling the dead body and the other community initiative cleaning and the settings requires beyond the face mask. Next, please. Uh, then uh, for COVID treatment centers, uh, we have designated places for donning doffing of PPEs. We put it on the protocol SOPs 
that all the centers require uh, at the entrance donning uh, rooms at, uh, uh, on the exit, the doffing of the PPE rooms. Uh, that was initially designed, including the design. And also during the monitoring, also we are conducting uh, to confirm that the treatment center really have a uh, proper uh, places for donning doffing. And then the used PPE is considered and treated as infectious wastes and uh, we managed to include on the training also during monitoring how they are handling the used PPEs uh, uh, on, 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 on as far as this, uh, SOPs. Uh, we assessed PPE availability uh, during supportive supervisions and also during uh, IPC program monitoring. Uh, we, we were using the WHO scorecard, you know, using the WHO scorecard, the scale up of this scorecard in more than uh, even uh, thousand around thousand health facilities really helps us a lot uh, to really assess the PPE availability uh, of you know in especially uh, COVID and non-COVID treatment centers. Next, please. So the key challenges uh, were you know uh, misuse of PPEs in some occasions. You know uh, WHO brought uh, rational use of PPEs. Uh, despite that uh, guidance, there was uh, misuse of PPEs in some areas. In some places, uh, rather than using the, the face mask, uh, people use, you know, N95 in, uh, in, uh, in areas where that's not recommended. Uh, and also there is a lack of adherence with recommended PPEs. Uh, this, uh, we found that it may be due to carelessness, discomfort, forgetfulness, and the perception of the risk and the fearfulness also. You know, for those who are, you know, uh, abusing or overusing is a fear, the, the unnecessary fear. For those underusing is also, uh, you know, discomfort, forgetfulness, and, uh, you know, uh, lack of perception of the risk. Uh, there is another challenge was a shortage of appropriate PPEs. In some facilities, the allocated uh, amount of PPE was not sufficient. Uh, which leads to uh, dissatisfaction, frustration of healthcare workers. And, uh, you know, uh, some of them even afraid of providing the service. So uh, sometimes shortage become a real challenge to continue the service. And the other challenge was uh, the high cost of PPEs is stock out, especially during 2020. I know production and then even the cost of the cover alls, uh, the, the gowns, and the, even the other. Uh, initially, even the, the, the face mask was really a bit higher cost, so it was really a challenge. Uh, but uh, finally, in 2021, uh, that was better. Uh, lack of technical uh, specification, uh, especially uh, manufacturers for those manufacturing locally, uh, you know, uh, not following, even if technical specification given, uh, some of them they are not following. Then uh, when they produce, uh, the country is lacking a, how to really confirm uh, the manufacturers are following the technical specification, uh, like uh, the WHO's recommendation is there, but you know, uh, how to really confirm uh, whether they produce it based on the technical specification was a challenge. Next, please. So the way forward, uh, it is, you know, we, we based on our uh, experience and the lessons learned, uh, we are, uh, this is our way forward. Uh, we have to update the PPE guidelines uh, as deemed necessary because things are changing from time to time due to dynamicity. Whenever there is a need, uh, we have to update the guideline, PPE implementation or SOPs for PPEs. Uh, we have to provide proper education and uh, demonstration. How to use the PPE requires demonstration and uh, the education part includes uh, demonstration should be uh, provided uh, updates information and also uh, any uh, you know health service provider even the community should know uh, proper use of it. Uh, the PPE is required that requires uh, proper education uh, we have to ensure availability and the proper use of PPEs through uh, monitoring as well as uh, continuous supervision uh, well, that is very important for the program uh, the other thing is uh, we have to avail job aids and the posters on PPEs. 
to for proper use in the you know, disposal of the PPEs properly. Uh, conducting periodic supervision, as opposed to supervision, peer observation. Uh, for PPE utilization, we found that the peer observation is very important. That should be uh, you know, really promoted in the requiring even a tool for peer observation. Uh, that is what we found uh, as critical element of the PPE utilization. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I think I have finished my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed, for sharing your experience and in particular stressing two important points. The one is that um, PPE is only effective when it's used in combination with other control measures and that it should be selected based on a risk assessment that was done. So thank you very much for, for your contribution. So our next speaker is Professor Ogunzula, but before we um, will give her a chance, we are going to have a 10 minute health break in which we are going to show a video. So just give me a minute and I will share the video with you. Hello, my name is Mark Mendelssohn, I'm an infectious diseases doctor, and I'm going to, to, today I'm going to show you how to put on and take off personal protective equipment when you're looking after a patient with COVID-19. We also term this donning, either putting on, and doffing, the taking off. So the most important thing to know about donning and doffing personal protective equipment is that what you do must be done slowly, it must be done thoughtfully and with purpose. So the putting on of personal protective equipment, the first thing we do is we ensure that our hands are clean. So we perform hand hygiene. This can be done with soap and water. I'm gonna be using alcohol-based hand rub today. And we basically use one to three mils of this. And we start by using our fingertips and then we go through the stages of hand hygiene to ensure our hands are really clean. And this takes about 20 seconds. You can sing your favorite tune, you can sing happy birthday, whatever you like. Keep rubbing until it's dry, as I said, around 20 seconds. So the first piece of personal protective equipment that I'm going to put on is an apron. Now you may be using a gown as well, that's fine. For this demonstration, I'm going to be using an apron. And I'm going to put the apron on. It goes over my head. There will be a surface on the outside that can become contaminated. The inner surface will remain uncontaminated. I'm going to take the ties and just behind my back and make a very loose bow, which can either be undone or can be ripped when I'm taking it off. The next piece of equipment I'm going to put on is an N95 respirator for this demonstration. If you're not performing aerosol procedures, and that would be so normal care, one would use just a surgical mask. The N95 respirator is used for those procedures where an aerosol may be generated. So when you're taking the nasopharyngeal or, and oropharyngeal swabs, or if you're intubating the patient. So I'm going to be using, demonstrating N95 respirator today. There are two straps on these. So you would put on the respirator. One strap goes below the ears, the other strap above the ears. And then we mold the respirator at the top, has a metal band, so we mould it onto the nose and we make sure that the surfaces are aligned to the face and then we can test by breathing in and breathing out. And when we breathe out, we're trying to ensure that there is no air leakage. And just take your time, it's important that you take your time at this stage to be absolutely sure that it's well moulded. Because um, I'm going to be doing a procedure which has aerosolization. I'm also going to be using face protection. 
I'm going to be demonstrating the use of goggles. You may, if you don't have goggles, also be using a full face visor. And I'll come on to say why that's important when we're taking it off. But for this, I'm going to be using goggles. And I'm going to make sure that these goggles go onto my face with a good fit. It's important to ensure that there's no hair in the seal to, to make a good fit and that it's comfortable. The last piece of equipment I'm going to be putting on are your gloves. I'm going to be using non-sterile gloves for this. And that is the donning or the putting on procedure for personal protective equipment for a patient that you're looking after with COVID-19. So I'm now going to show you how to take off this equipment safely. So for this, you're going to need an appropriate bin to place the waste. And again, you want to be sure that you're doing this in a slow, controlled manner. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take off the gloves. If that's because of all this equipment, the most likely thing to be the most heavily contaminated are the gloves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to peel off the first glove and so now exposing the non-exposed part. And then for the second glove, I'm going to place my finger underneath into the non-contaminated part and just bring it through. So this is now uncontaminated and I'm going to place it in the bin. I'm going to actually perform hand hygiene now because I've taken off the most potentially contaminated part. And so I'm going to just perform hand hygiene. The critical thing about hand hygiene when you're taking it off is to ensure that you do hand hygiene at the end. I'm going to be doing hand hygiene in between each step, just in this demonstration, but the critical thing is that at the end, I also think it's important personally that one does it after the gloves come off, just in case you've touched the glove. The next piece of equipment that I'm going to take off in this demonstration is the apron or the gown. If you are wearing a face visor, which comes down low under the face, if you've got an apron that you cannot rip off, it's very difficult to get an apron over your head with a big visor on. And in those circumstances, we would suggest that the visor comes off first and then the apron. In this demonstration, I'm wearing goggles and I'm going to show you first how to take off the apron. I'm going to undo the straps. I'm not going to touch the front of the apron at all. Move it away from my body. And I'm now touching the uncontaminated surface. I'm going to pull it down and over my head. And then I'm just going to bring that surface up and place it in the bin. I'm going to perform a little bit of hand hygiene now. And the next piece of equipment I'm going to be taking off are the goggles. You do not want to touch the front of the goggles. Take your hands behind your head, find the strap, and remove the goggles in one flow and place them on a surface where they can then be cleaned. Finally, I'm going to be taking off the mask. And the same goes for the mask. We do not want to touch the front of the mask. So I'm going to go behind my head. I'm going to take off the lower one and then the upper band. Remove them from my face and discard. If you are working in a COVID ward where you're seeing multiple patients continuously, you can keep that N95 respirator on, if that's what you're wearing, or the, or the surgical mask, for as long as the integrity of the mask continues. At the end of the procedure, it's critical again to perform good hand hygiene. And because I've been wearing an apron and not a gown, I'm also going to just ensure that my forearms, which have been exposed, also get a bit of alcohol hand rub. So that is how to put on, don, and take off or doff personal protective equipment, PPE, 
for the management of a patient with COVID-19. Thank you. So thank you very much for listening. And I think in this video, Professor Mark Mendelssohn also stressed what Dr. Ahmed said um, about the importance of the order in which we take on and um, take off our PPE. All right, so without further ado, ado we're going to um, move to our next speaker, who is Professor Shade Ogonzola. Um, Professor Shade is the consult is a consultant for clinical microbiology and, and IPC at the University of Lagos in Nigeria, and she's also the chairperson of ICANN. And Professor, Professor Ogonzola is going to talk about the PPE dilemma, changes in future IPC practices. So over to you, um, Professor, Professor Ogunzola. I just want to confirm, Lizzie, are you going to share Professor um, Shade's presentation? Hi, Priet. I think she'll be sharing from, from her side. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I prefer Shade. Yeah, thank you. I, I was out. We can see your screen, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, good afternoon. Um, I, I hope that it will go smoothly because I've had um, quite a bit of challenge joining today. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about um, PPE shortages and how we deal with them. Um, so I, I won't waste too much time. Africa has a PPE deficit. Um, when we look at the distribution of healthcare workers, as of uh, 2020, there are over 2 million doctors, nurses, pharmacists, lab scientists, and community healthcare workers, of which 60% of all these were nurses. Nigeria, Uganda, and South Africa alone account for greater than 370,000 healthcare workers. And it was estimated in 2020 um, looking at the number of cases that we had, active cases, that's about 90,000 plus, that we would require over 500,000 PPE daily. And so that there was an urgent need for stakeholders to, one, increase output of PPE, because that was part of the um, whole um, national, I mean, international problem, the global problem as well as finding ways to have PPE produced on our continent so that our needs could be met. And the demand for PPE has been projected to keep growing. Um, it's been, um, there's, um, the, the, there's a, uh, there's that by 2025, um, that's PPE requirements, will be about um, 92.5 billion US dollars. So it's continuously rising. However, most of the players are in America, Europe, and Asia Pacific, those who are pr producing. We have started production on the African continent, but we're not yet a market player. And we're clearly, um, at the receiving end of, or should I say we are in danger if the need keeps growing and we don't meet these needs. So we have on the continent, the ACT Accelerator Group, that's the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. And early this year, the WHO DG talked about the 23 billion US dollars that was needed to end the pandemic as a global emergency in 2022. Of this 16 billion was needed for supplies and then the remaining for rollout. And it was believed, it has been calculated that the 16 billion 
would give us 600 million doses of vaccine for 70% coverage in all countries by mid-2022, um, would give us enough PPE to protect 1.7 million of the 2.7 million healthcare workers that would be needed, would support clinical trials to address variants of concern, would be that if um, there will be treatment for 120 million people, and then there will be four, it would provide 433 cubic meters of oxygen, which is 100% of all the oxygen needed in low income countries, and would also give us 700 million of the 988 million tests required for, for uh, test and treat and test and trace. but we don't have that now. So there are challenges of PPE use and accessibility. We have inadequate quantities of PPE. There has been over, over the last two years, a proliferation of substandard PPE, partly because there are inadequate accreditation systems. There has been inadequate production on the continent to meet our needs. Sometimes there is PPE, but there's poor access. There have been problems with distribution. So some places get more PPE than others, even within the same country. The cost of PPE went up. And then on the side of healthcare workers and people, there has been inappropriate use of PPE, um, inadequate logistic planning, and reuse of PPE by healthcare workers. So clearly there's an ongoing need for rational use of PPE on the African continent. And just so that we can, even though you've had some lectures, to remind us that PPE includes the gloves, the medical masks, the goggles, the face shield and gowns, as well as for specific procedures, respirators and aprons, and acts as a barrier preventing direct contact of the skin or mucous membranes with blood, body fluids, respiratory secretions, and excretions. And that we always use PPE according to the anticipated contact with blood, body fluids, respiratory secretions, excretions, mucous membranes, and non-intact skin. So PPE is always used for something. And in wearing PPE rationally, it, it's always procedure-based. And we put PPE on before procedure and remove directly thereafter, and then we wash our hands. And when used properly, PPE can help prevent the spread of infection from one person to another. And we know that it serves a specific purpose and must be used as a part of the hierarchy of controls in infection control. Using PPE alone, does not fully protect you. So you have to use it with other measures that are in IPC. Either you're eliminating, a, a physically removing a hazard, you're replacing the hazard, you're isolating people from the hazard, or you've changed the way people work before then you go on to PPE, which is the least effective. So the use of PPE for COVID-19 requires a risk evaluation of the level of care. And so we use PP at the different levels, triage, when we're collecting specimens for lab diagnosis, when we have suspected or confirmed cases of COVID-19 requiring healthcare facility admission, and there's no aerosol generating procedure, or when we have suspected or confirmed cases of COVID-19 requiring healthcare facility admission, and there is an aerosol generating procedure. So before you carry out care on any patient, certain questions must be asked. What contact, which goes to the contact, the procedure, and what the risk you have? So what contact will I have with the patient? What is the likely infection that the patient has? What is the mode of transmission? And then what procedure am I going to perform on this patient? What is the risk of splashes, sprays, needle stick, inhalation, aerosols? And then what are the available means of preventing or minimizing the risk? And what PPE will I also need to use? These questions must always be asked by the healthcare worker as they do their work. And so if you look at the hierarchy of controls in the context of COVID, it means Physically removing the hazard, that will be at the triage, where you triage patients at the point of entry. Replacing the hazard. Can you, 
Hello? Sorry. Um, applying the COVID bundle to replace the hazard. When you isolate patients, you isolate positive cases, you improve their ventilation, change the way people work, you follow the guidelines um, that, are, that exist, the protocols that exist within your facility and you improve the infrastructure, the M and E you, you, and the feedback. And then protecting the worker with personal protective equipment. You will see then that the PPE is at the bottom of this whole hierarchy. You need to have, it has to be part of the whole gamut of controls that are done for it to be really um, effective. And then in using PPE, you must, in, you must be good quality, you must have the supplies and the people must be adequately trained. So who should wear the PPE? All healthcare workers who face the public, those who care for patients with symptoms, e.g. suspected cases with COVID-19, all lab staff, all support staff, cleaners, waste handlers, et cetera, and family members who care for COVID-19 patients. There are types of PPE use. Um, I should also mention that some of these slides are from Professor Shaheen Mehta. Um, the types of PPE used in healthcare delivery settings, gloves to protect our hands, gowns and aprons, masks to protect the mouth and the nose, the respirators to protect against infectious agents, goggles to protect our eyes, face shield to protect our face, the mouth, the nose and the eyes. So when for PPE, and because it's always associated with the care, we have PPE that is needed at different levels of care. So for a triage, you don't need more than a medical mask and then hand hygiene. When you're collecting samples, hand hygiene, the gown, a respirator, and the goggles or face shield. When you have a suspected case that, it, but there's no aerosol generating procedure, the hand hygiene, the gown, the medical mask, the goggles and the gloves. And when there is aerosol generating procedure, you use the hand hygiene, the gown, and then you substitute the medical mask for the respirator and then use your goggles and gloves. So just to remind us why medical masks are different from any mask and why what a good quality medical mask is, they will be fluid resistant. They don't need fit testing. They contain a layer of polypropylene spawn bond, which is a filter within them. So if you open up a medical mask, it has these layers of filter. They can be used for up to two hours or longer if they're intact and not damp. Once they go damp, you need to discard them. You use these in all areas of healthcare facility and it must be used by all healthcare workers in healthcare facilities. Um, the WHO recommends the ASTM F2, F2100 level 203 or EN14683. Um, so the, flu the fluid resistance is important. The bacterial filtration efficiency, about three microns. Particle filtration efficiency of 0.1 micron. And it must have a differential pressure that allows for breathing that's not too resistant so that breathing is easy. Respirators, on the other hand, these are used for aerosol generating procedures and healthcare workers working on COVID-19 wards need to use this. This is a new um, um, guide from the WHO based on the press because of uh, the, the, the the, the high infection um, transmission rate of the Omicron virus. And, but you must, it must fit properly and it's only used by healthcare workers and you cannot use the one that has a filter. This is not good for source control because this filter allows microorganisms to pass through. Um, so it does not contain the aerosols within the mask. So the, the um, respirator itself also has multiple layers of polypropylene spawn bound and has improved filtration. This is the cup shaped one. You can see within it, you have this. And for the duck bill one, you also have these layers of filter. 
and they do not have an expiration valve. This is not to be used for infection control. So, however, in the community, as we have shortages, it's clear that if we're going to be able to manage our PPE, the masks that are medically efficacious have to be used by healthcare workers. So it is advised, preferably, that those in the community that are not taking care of anybody with COVID can use fabric masks. Um, so does it give you any protection? It depends on the quality, how it's made. The WHO advised on having multiple layers of um, for the uh, cloth mask. So if you have hybrid con combinations of two layers of high thread cotton, and polyester or polypropylene batting. It works very well. And it helps to, it has filtration efficiencies. Some of these have filtration efficiencies as high as over 80% for particles that are less than 300 nanometers and over 90% for particles greater than 300 nanometers. So it's a, it's a good source, con uh, 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 source controls. So if everybody's wearing it, then it means only a little bit of um, aerosols are out in the open for people to breathe in. What is important though, is that it must be well, it must fit very well. There must be very little gap between the mask and the facial contour. And there are many ways people have worked on this. You tie the, the side so that it cups the face. Um, so when properly done, um, these, when, when properly done, the, the masks have much better protection than when there are gaps. Gaps in the, map, in the mask on either side can reduce the performance of the mask by about 50%. The other good thing about fabric masks, in addition to helping us to conserve PPE for healthcare workers, is that they are environmentally friendlier because you can wash, wash them and reuse them. So everyone should have at least two, preferably three, so that you can wash and renew. And when you take it off, you put it in a bag, a waterproof bag, till you can get home and wash it. So how do these filters work? There are two, there are about four methods of the way that they work what you call inertial impaction. And with this mechanism, the particles are, are too large. So this is the way it catches the larger uh, particles. They're too large to continue to flow with the airstream. So they are diverted around a filter fiber and they're caught. So you have the particle there, it's caught. So it cannot work. Interception, this happens as the particles pass close to a filter fiber they may be intercepted by the filter, by the fiber. Again, this is what happens with larger particles. Now, the smaller particles work more with diffusion because these smaller particles are constantly bombarded by air molecules, which cause them to deviate from the airstream and come into contact with the filter fiber, and then they are trapped. So this is responsible for smaller particles. The other thing that works for small particles um, is the electrostatic charge, which attracts these small particles to a charged fiber. And this, um, this mechanism does not favor certain bigger particle sizes. It's much more useful for smaller particle sizes. Then we look at gloves. These protect our hands from direct contact, but they also reduce hand contamination by 70% to 80% only. And so you need to discard them after each patient's use, and you must discard them if they become damaged, they're torn or they're punctured. And immediately you've taken them off, you wash your hands or you, you wash your hands. You do not wash or disinfect gloves because it can affect the integrity of the gloves and it is easier to use your, to wash your hands. You also do not wear gloves and go around touching surfaces all over the place because then you continue to transmit. So 
when you're working with gloves, you work from clean area to dirty. So you work in places that are clean or on the body parts that are clean, and then you move to dirty. You must replace your gloves when they're torn, punctured, heavily soiled, and after every patient. You wash your hands after removing the gloves. You must wash them when you attend to your clinical notes. You don't touch your face or adjust your PPE with contaminated gloves. You do not touch environmental surfaces except necessary with your gloves. You don't apply alcohol to the gloves. The gowns and apron should fully cover the torso and fit comfortably over the body and have long sleeves that fit snugly at the wrist. The factors that guide your selection of whether to use a gown or apron as PPE will depend on your purpose. Gowns with long sleeves that are water repellent are preferred and used for isolation precautions. Aprons occasionally are used when, where you have limited contamination. For example, if you're just entering the room and you're just going to speak to the uh, patient or uh, you're, you're observing and you're not coming in close contact, you do not need to wear a gown and you can wear an um, apron. If you're going to be in close contact with the patient, you should use your gown if by any means you think that the arms may get contaminated. Another factor is the material of the gown, whether it is a re reusable or a disposable. Oftentimes the reusable are fabric, and if you will be in any contact with fluid or splashes, you, you might need to wear an apron over it. Um, then, because the other thing you want is that the gown is resistant to fluid penetration. And then whether it's clean or sterile, you only use sterile when you have sterile procedures and for aseptic procedures. So during PPE shortages, PPE must be prioritized for healthcare workers and caregivers. You have to optimize the use of PPE through care planning, bundling of your activities, and using alternatives to face-to-face -face interactions where the quality of care can be maintained. You use your PPE items according to the transmission risk. Standard and based, transmission-based precautions should be accordingly applied when providing care to patients. And then you expand your PPE availability by evaluating PPE items tested to functionally equivalent international standards. You want to use quality um, PPE. Otherwise, we, it's, there is no point using PPE that's not efficacious because then you, it, it's, it, it's, um, it means that you, you are not protected and one just has a sense of um, confidence that's misplaced. So the WHO mentioned ways to optimize the availability of personal protective equipment that irrespective of measures implemented. And these are, you minimize your PPE need as much as possible. You use your PPE appropriately, and then you coordinate your PPE supply chain. And irrespective of the measures implemented and available, Healthcare workers must be trained in the correct use of PPE and the associated IPC measures that are required to keep them safe. There must be competencies in procedures for donning and doffing the PPE required for direct care of patients with COVID-19 and other occupational health and safety measures should be regularly reviewed. The PPE should be used in combination with administrative, environmental and engineering controls. And as said earlier, it must always be based on risk assessment. So it's not, a, uh, you do not use PP that you have a standard use. It's always based on assessment. So in optimizing your PPE use and reducing the need for it, there might be a need to consider alternatives to face-to-face -face outpatient visits. Um, you should use physical barriers where possible that extend above the head of all people who are standing. You should streamline your clinical activities when necessary by cohorting patients with COVID-19 as long as they have no other co-infection um, um, with um, healthcare transmissible pathogens. So you cohort them in the same rooms and designate where possible dedicated healthcare worker teams to care exclusively for these patients. 
oftentimes we do not have the luxury to dedicate um, healthcare workers exclusively, but it is possible to have one or two that you would say, these are the only ones that will use, will attend to these patients. They may do other things, but they, they, not everybody will attend to these to the patients. But where possible, do des designate des dedicated healthcare workers. It is also necessary, once you have those dedicated, to restrict the number of healthcare workers that enter the rooms of people with COVID-19, if they're not involved in providing essential care. Now, when we talk of bundling the care, it means maybe when you're taking the temperature is when you will give the drug so that you do not have to come in and go out because each time you come into the room, then you have to use PPE. But if you go in and do a number of things together, it reduces your need for PPE. It is also important that healthcare workers perform risk assessment so that they will use PPE appropriately. Where you have known or suspected community or clusters of SARS-CoV-2 transmission, visitors should be limited in inpatient healthcare settings. And wherever they're using PPE, there must be clear instructions about what PPE is required, how to don it, how to um, um, doff it. There should be regular audit of the, you know, audit of the hygiene and consider escorting visitors in and out of the health setting when it's appropriate, if it's appropriate. So that when visitors come, they're not wandering and checking other people because sometimes visitors come in to see one person and go to other places as well. Now, when you do not have, you still do not have enough PPE, then in certain circumstances, you are allowed to use PPE for extended periods. And when we talk of extended use, that is the use of any PPA item for a longer period than normal, according to standards for the conventional use and according to manufacturer's recommendations. And these, the, the need for extended use must be limited to scenarios where healthcare workers are providing continuous care or assessment to a cohort of patients with confirmed COVID-19 who are not additionally suspected or confirmed of other healthcare transmissible infections. And this is because there are dangers to extended use of PPE. There's the increased risk of contamination of environment of other patients. The healthcare worker must ensure that their PPE is not manipulated during or in between patient encounters. Any PPE that has been used for a patient encounter still needs to be discarded when doffed. The staff must be trained properly to prevent self-contamination during prolonged use. Um, PPE, another way to do this, if you have to use extended use, is to use PPE when they have when they're used beyond their expiration date. In other words, you have a whole store of PPE that have expired. They can be allowed to be used under certain conditions when you have acute shortages, as long as they're not degraded, there are no tears, they're not, they're not, um, um, they're, they're, they're not wet, and so can be used safely. Respirators can have been found to still be effective if they have been well stored and show no degradation. However, this determination would need is preferred to be made by someone who's trained so that it's not an individual decision. So it should be done with proper guidelines and there should be those who have ascertained that these PPEs can be used. So it's not a, a, a personal decision. It should be done as a part of the institutional um, protocols. There has been a lot of talk about reprocessing of PPE. And we, I do know, and many of us will know, many people who think that you can reprocess. In fact, the, uh, the social media is full of ways that you can reprocess your PPE um, safely. In general, single-use PPE items should not be reprocessed. We know that only, the only ones that can be reprocessed are PPE that have been designed to be used multiple times, such as cotton gowns and eye protections that can be um, cleaned with compatible decontamination methods. 
but the new methods such as heat, microwave, ultraviolet, ultraviolet radiation are not yet well established and their safety is not always assured. In addition, you will require the right equipment. They can be used only on some PPE that can withstand their use. And, these, and even under these circumstances, they must be used in what is considered a crisis situation when there are no other uh, choices but to reprocess. But to be able to do this, it has to be done by trained personnel using the right equipment. And it's not all PPE, not all masks that can be reprocessed. Medical masks don't do very well with reprocessing. The respirators are better at being reprocessed than the medical masks. In general, you will not reprocess uh, um, disposable gowns and disposable aprons. So in general, reprocessing of PPE, which I know a number of people use, still think they can do because there's a lot of information on social media is not advised and cannot and there is no guarantee that they work efficaciously secondly not all ppe lend themselves to reprocessing and to do reprocessing it needs someone who's trained who understands the type of ppe it is not an individual decision so in summary the use of PPE to allay your personal fear without indication for a procedure can sometimes increase your risk of infection. It is not a substitute for poor infection control practices. So you must use it within the hierarchy of control with all the other infection control procedures. All PPE have a limited life and must be discarded after use as indicated, usually after each patient use. They should not be used between patients. In other words, you use the PPE and then you want to do some other things and you keep your PPE on and then no, you should not. Extended use of one face cover uh, gloves will increase the risk of transmission of pathogens to the healthcare provider as well as to patients. For economic reasons, respirators may be reused usually in the context of tuberculosis under strict conditions. The PPE must be of good quality and fulfill the requirements of use. To remind us, PPE itself can be a transmitter of microbes when contaminated. So you must wash your hands before and after using your PPE. Thank you for this. Thank you very much, Professor um, Ogonzola, for a very detailed um, presentation, um, as well as very practical. I'm sure everybody learned a lot from it. Um, and thank you for st stressing again the importance of the fact that PPE is not a substitute for poor, poor IPC principles, and also the importance of a risk assessment and then the detail on how to do a risk assessment. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Lizzie Sitoli Mazibuku, who is going to attend to the question. So thank you, Lizzie, and over to you. Uh, thank you, Priet. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you so much to the presenters for the very informative session that we've had on uh, the, uh, the PPE. I'll also like to welcome the other panelists that are joining us from um, WHO, from CDC, and from uh, country offices, that is Uganda and uh, Zambia, and welcome to our Q&A session. Uh, our first question will be directed to Dr. Fami, and it reads, as a country, did you have challenges on disposing masks by the public? If so, how are you tackling this? Over to you, Dr. Fami. Okay, uh, thank you. This is a really uh, a good question uh, from me. I think uh, most of us in different countries have that challenge, uh, especially uh, at workplaces, you know, uh, we had a challenge. So uh, well, along the COVID, uh, 
prevention uh, during the COVID pandemic, during the last two years, uh, the IPC program was scaled up, not uh, at health facilities. We also scaled it up at uh, workplaces and the community areas like that of, you know, uh, uh, in different community initiatives uh, during the burials, uh, community gatherings, and other things. So uh, we had a training package, uh, uh, both for workplace uh, initiative as well as uh, community initiatives. For, so we include uh, uh, on, uh, on our SOP that was developed uh, IPC uh, for community gathering, uh, IPC at workplaces. You know, we included uh, promoting uh, new, the handling of the used uh, masks, especially, uh, as well as in some initiatives, we are using gloves, uh, as well as the you know the uh, the uh, plastic aprons that have been shown by the especially for by the uh, cleaners. But the major problem was with the mask, uh, especially it is, it is with the mask because. The mask was, uh, you know, uh, as per recommendation, was used uh, intensively. So uh, we observed that uh, people are throwing the mask uh, on the streets, uh, we observed on the streets, at workplaces. So uh, we are really suggesting that, you know, we are promoting, we develop even uh, promotional, uh, you know, uh, posters to encourage people uh, to really put it on uh, a garbage pit. Uh, yeah, at workplace, uh, we are also we are also advocating to use a separate uh, dustbin or uh, covered with plastics, uh, not only open dustbin, uh, covered with plastic, uh, putting plastic inside. So uh, uh, we are monitoring whenever we do some you know supportive supervision at workplaces. Uh, we are intensively monitoring uh, how they dispose it. So uh, we try to manage uh, with this, uh, you know, including the initiative, I mean, the promotion of use of uh, proper disposal of the masks at the workplace using, uh, you know, the proper dustbins with plastics and also on the streets uh, disposing. And uh, even on the streets, we are recommending people are using the, the clothes mask. So on the SOP, we put, uh, you know, proper handling of the clothes mask using the plastic box and then uh, handling accordingly when they reach home uh, to dispose if it is disposable uh, mask uh, for closed mask uh, to put it on a, a zipped you know a plastic bag or non zip one and then wash it accordingly immediate washing uh, or timely washing over uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fami, for that uh, response. I'll uh, invite uh, other presenters and panelists if they would want to uh, uh, add on to what Dr. Fami said with regards to what is being done in their countries. Uh, Dr. Roni, over to you. Thank you so very much, Lizzie, um, uh, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, back in Uganda, we are facing a similar challenge, just like uh, all other countries, I believe, uh, with uh, handling waste that is generated from um, uh, waste, I mean, from uh, use of masks. And um, as a country, we are emphasizing um, health education on how best they can be able to discard the masks uh, through the health promotion uh, component of the response. Um, it goes uh, without saying that uh, behavior, practices, and attitudes play a very big role in how people uh, play out with uh, a certain practices. And uh, that is one of the challenges that we face. But uh, we continue to talk to the masses. We continue to run uh, media campaigns that are educating people on how they speak and discard masks. And uh, we have uh, video uh, clips that uh, run on uh, national TV are demonstrating to the population on how best we can be able to deal with waste generated from the use of masks. And uh, we've uh, had uh, uh, a long-running campaign on uh, plastic bags, so this is also running alongside 
um, that campaign um, with the, the National Environmental Management Authority uh, taking place and uh, showing people or demonstrating to the population uh, the effect of uh, ineffective or poor handling of these uh, uh, masks or the waste that is generated physically. So uh, we we continue um, facing the challenge and we continue educating the masses um, by providing um, a, a appropriate uh, waste isolation or segregation um, containers at all service points, but then the main state is uh, through health education. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Roni, for the response. And uh, uh, Prof. Shade, would you want to add uh, a bit of insight on the Nigerian situation? Over to you, Prof. Hello, Prof. Sorry, I was talking without um, uh, on muting. Um, I wanted to say that I, I actually didn't quite catch the question because my 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 Wi-Fi is a little funny. Can you just re tell me what it was, what the exact question was? Okay, Prof. Uh, the question was uh, uh, centering on the challenges on disposing masks oh. by the, uh, by the public. Oh yes, it's it's a major problem um, everywhere. Um, um, in in Nigeria, you, you we we actually have a, a, a great challenge dealing with um, the uh, medical masks that are being used in the public space. A lot of people, you know, all these um, um, have sort of left um, the fabric masks and are using the ones that are disposable. And it's becoming a major challenge that is being looked at. We have, a, in, for example, in some parts of the country, we have people who take care of medical waste, but we're, you're, we're beginning to see masks clogging up, uh, gutters, masks everywhere. So it's something that we still, we have not, I mean, that has not been fully addressed because it is a major challenge. Um, my thought is from as much as possible, if we can convince um, the public to use fabric masks in between, I mean, if they're not, if they don't have people who are ill so that they're reusing this and washing it, properly made fabric masks will help. But till then, I think it's, should I say this is the next on the agenda in terms of major challenges to how we're going to, you know, environmental problems that we're going to have. Um, I think I'm not sure any of us have fully are fully on top of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, the next question is uh, directed to you, Prof. And uh, after you have uh, answered, if uh, Dr. Fami also has additionals, he can come in. It's with regards to uh, the PPE limitations and. Uh, it reads, the, you know that these equipments have their own limitations, useful life, disposal, maintenance, and proper care. And uh, so are there any frequencies of updating the guidelines and is there any system or procedure or department that has been created by WHO or Africa CDC to follow this up? Over to you, Prof. Um, I think I need to understand that very well. Is it in terms of guidelines? Because the WHO and Africa CDC do have guidelines as to how to use our PPE. Um, and they're constantly looking at what's going on and changing the guidelines as, um, as, the, as um, events um, occur. So I'm not sure if, um, if I got that question properly. Um, but yes, the WHO, they have, uh, uh, they have departments that can, that can oversee these changes in guidelines and they're constantly updating guidelines. So it's just to got, get on, you know, to get onto those sites, their website and get them. Uh, for example, in terms of PPE, there was a recent uh, update to mask use that allows for healthcare workers 
in, to use uh, um, even when there's no AGP because of um, Omicron and its, uh, its rapid rate of transmission to use um, a, a respirator if you, if you, um, if you feel that you, you will be in danger. Um, even though the medical mask, they, it is stated there that medical mask is still good, but if you feel that you are in increase, you can take, you can decide to use an N95 within the healthcare facility. So even when you're not doing an um, AG, um, aerosol generating procedure. So these guidelines keep coming out. The same thing with the Africa CDC. They, they come out, they're updating their guidelines as well constantly. I, I hope that answers your question, but I'm sure there's somebody from WHO who can answer better. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prof, uh, for the answer. And uh, over to you, Dr. Fami. Okay, uh, thank you. You know, uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, one of the concerns, uh, especially during the COVID, uh, since the things are changing based on the evidence, you know, since this, this is a new virus uh, uh, from uh, now and then, uh, even uh, uh, in three months time, six months time, several things are changing. There are new updates, research findings. So uh, we all remember that at the beginning of 2020, uh, there was the, an interim guideline uh, which was updated both based on the previous standard guidance uh, for uh, COVID, general uh, IPC guidance. Then uh, immediately after three, four months, we had uh, the, the, the mask and other uh, uh, rational use of IPC guidance. Then at the end, we do have also uh, guidance on uh, mask. So, you know, uh, uh, from uh, past experience, what we have seen is, WHO, especially the headquarter, uh, and also the African regional office, uh, basically it's all the headquarter, developing the updating the guidance based on the evidence. Uh, so this is happening. So even if, whenever there is a requirement, and you know, in the future also, uh, this, there must be an update uh, on the guidance. Uh, here is, a, but the mandate is the WHO mandate, especially this mandate is the headquarters mandate whenever developing a guide, a guideline is developed by higher level. But uh, when that guideline comes out uh, based on the, the evidence uh, specific region, uh, African regional office can also adopt you know, or modify that guidance. In the countries also then taking that guidance, uh, update guidance can develop their own based on the, 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 the available condition or resource availability uh, on the ground but without violating the, the basic rules or uh, regulations, SOP recommendations, uh, that really reduces the risk. So we are always addressing the risk, you know, based on the risk assessment, we have to minimize the risk. So I, I saw one uh, question, on, you know, uh, from attendees, uh, do we require removing the rings uh, while uh, donning doffing? Yeah, it is a standard, there's no, modification with this one, you know, sightings uh, are not going to be modified. It's so IPC standard, standard precaution is standard precaution. So based on the, the evidence on the virus, we may uh, modify, you know, for instance, using uh, masks or N95 for different occasions purposes. So uh, what type of, you know, gowns which should we use? Uh, is it cover all? Uh, is it uh, 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 short sleeved gowns, long sleeved? So it depends on the the, the risk of the virus uh, uh, having uh, you know contaminating our body or uh, part of the body. So uh, as, uh, this is uh, it's my reflection. Over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fami. And the next question is directed to Prof. Shade. Uh, there are actually two questions on that, but they are dealing with uh, the use of gloves during uh, mass vaccination. The first one is, uh, what's the SOP for the use of gloves during mass uh, vaccination? And um, the second one, now I can't find it, but it was also um, 
touching on the use of gloves during uh, vaccination. Over to you, Prof. Prof, you are muted. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, the general SOP uh, concerning gloves during um, vaccination is, is really do a hand hygiene. You do not actually need to wear gloves if you're vaccinating because the possibility of having um, splashing or um, is really minimized. I know people do use them, but it is not an absolute necessity. Um, not using them does not put you at great tricks, but you must do a proper hand hygiene in between patients. Thank you, uh, Prof. And uh, the next question um, is directed to any of uh, the presenters or panelists, and it reads, how can a health facility deal with a short stock of PPE? Can they reuse masks? If so, how many times? I think one of the things we've talked about is actually how not to reuse masks. Um, what we would usually say is to minimize, it's, it's about optimizing. First of all, before you go to the stage of saying you're reusing masks, you want to first of all look at, is there a way there are some things we don't even need to do so that we don't have patients come in? So first of all, can we redo the way we work? and reduce patient contact, then we don't need masks, that's one. Two, um, if we have to use masks, can we bundle our activities so that we're using, we're doing a lot of things within the same time so that there's no need to take off masks or take off PPE. Um, then three, rather than reuse, it's can we use, can we put our work together in such a way we can use masks for an extended period of time? In general, once you've taken off the masks, we, it, it's, you, should, you should discard it. The only exception that it is not a, an advice, but it is possible if you're properly trained and under the right conditions, that respirators can be used for a longer time. And it has to be you know, reused a number of times, the respirators. Um, and in, in so doing, you must, one, make sure that when you take it off, it's put in a breathable mask. And if possible, to have more than one so that over a period of time, maybe to have like five respirators and you keep them for a number of days so that you're using them maybe one in five days and reusing them. That is possible. Um, it's not the best, but if one is constraint it's something you can do and if you do not have that then it's to put the mask in a container in a breathable container in such a way that you do not contaminate the sides and then you can wear them again in because the only part that's not contaminated by externals is is inside the mask so in in using reusing there has to be a lot of attention given to training the person in such a way that they do not contaminate the inside of the mask, that they do not contaminate their hands or contaminate their faces while handling the mask. So yes, you can reuse it, but it will be something we would say, please do not. And then the medical masks, definitely please do not reuse these. Um, um, some people also, to extend the life of respirators, for example, uh, will put a medical mask over it. I don't know if that works. I'm not even sure that is, uh, I'm giving you evidence. I'm just telling you what people ha have done. Um, but in general, please do not reuse. Um, we, we don't advise that you reuse the mask. But if you must, then the respirator is probably the best of the, is the better, of, is the one that is more easily used. But, we don't recommend uh, medical masks. They tend to get wet very quickly and are no longer safe. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, 
over to you, Dr. Fami and Dr. Roni, if you have any additionals. Uh, no, I think the prof well elaborated in the, so uh, put the rationale for reducing the needs. Over. Oh, thank, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lizzie. Um, just, uh, just like Dr. Fami has said, uh, prof um, was so elaborate about this. And uh, it's uh, the same uh, message that we've been giving now to our healthcare workers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Roni. And I'm um, just going through the questions on the Q&A and uh, most of the questions are centered on the masks. And there is uh, one popular uh, question. This one is uh, with regards to the colors and it's, it reads, the medical mask has different colors on each side. Is there a defined way on how to put them on, which is the inner or outer side does it matter which side one puts it on? Over to you, the presenters and panelists. Um, well, if nobody's talking, I can go ahead. Um, yes, it matters which um, which one you wear, um, what direction you, you, and then the colors matter. In general, the inner part is the white part. And that part is absorbent. The outer part has a layer of impermeable um, a film, impermeable film. So it's designed in such a way that the inner layer is more absorbent and better used for a source control. So that when you cough into that, it absorbs the secretions. So yes, it matters. The inner layer that's white, Generally, that inner layer is white, and then the outer layer has different colors. Could be black, could be blue, could be uh, yellow, could be green. Um, so that inner layer is the, the white one. Now, in saying that, there are lots of, in quotes, seeming medical masks. However, they do not have the filters in them. So you will find them very thin. And a lot of these, if you read the boxes, they'll say this is not a medical mask because really they don't have the filtration required for the kind of protection we're talking about. And for some of these, your cloth masks might be better. So there are lots of substandard apparent medical masks. And it's important that when we buy our medical masks, we make sure that they are medical masks that fit the, um, the requirement for safety. There are lots of masks out there that look like medical masks, um, but they're not. They don't have the filtration efficacy to be safe. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof, for the elaborate answer. I'll just uh, ask kindly the panelists and the presenters to tackle some of the questions that are in the Q&A box as we have uh, run, run out of time. At this point in time, I'd like to um, uh, thank you, the presenters and the panelists, and hand over to uh, Briette for the closing remarks. Over to you, Briette. Thank you very much, Lizzie, and thank you very much to the presenters and the panelists. Um, thank you for the very detailed presentations and, and based on the feedback from the audience, it's, um, it's, it appears that it was very helpful for everybody. So thank you very much for that. Um, please remember that we have another session next week um, and it will be about strengthening of IPC in communities. And so please um, to register and attend the webinar. Um, and then just again, thank you very much to the presenters and the panelists and also to Lizzie for handling the questions and answers. And we will see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.